start with a question. Does anybody not know what the dinner party is? If, if you don't, raise your hand. <laughs> don't be afraid. <laughs> yeah, this is your last chance. Okay. Um, then you probably all know it's permanently housed at the Brooklyn Museum since 2007, where it constitutes 20% of the traffic to the Brooklyn Museum. Um, I wanted to start by talking about why I undertook my study of women's history in the late 1960s. At that time, the prevailing point of view was that women had no history. I took a class at UCLA called the Intellectual History of Europe. And because I was always an ambitious young woman, I waited all semester to hear my professor explain what he said at the first session, which was that he would talk about women's contributions to intellectual history at the end. <laughs> and Okay, finally the class was over, and I can still see him. I don't know if professors still do this, but in those days they wore tweed jackets with <laughs> leather pants. <laughs> <laughs> so I can still see him striding across the stage saying, women's intellectual history, women's contributions to intellectual history, they made none. <gasps> And it was also the time when the prevailing idea was there had never been any great women artists. Since I had a lot of ambitions in terms of making a contribution to art history, that was very unnerving to me. And also in the first decade of my professional practice in LA, I was encountering all this opposition and sexism and misunderstanding. Fortunately, my father was a student of history. And so I decided at a time when there was very little information, which Diane will talk about, I decided to look back at history to see if it was really true what my professor had said. And as probably everybody knows, what I discovered was it was a complete lie that women had a huge history that was largely unknown and it had made me really angry to discover this lie. And, and, and anger can fuel creativity, which in my case it did. All by myself, with the hubris of youth, <laughs> I set out to overcome the cycle of erasure I had encountered in my studies. And then, <laughs> And then, oh, yeah, and then uh, I was about a year and a half into the dinner party working by myself and trying to assemble. Uh, by that time, I had decided that I was going to do uh, a dinner party, kind of based on the Last Supper, except that the history I wanted to take, tell I couldn't fit in a 13 place setting, which is how it became a triangle. And then I decided that one of the things I was discovering that was that the women I was encountering, and none of them had, quote, pulled themselves up by their bootstraps. In fact, there was a climate of support around them, whether it was their family, their partner, their spouse, the convent, but there was always a, some structure of support. And so I decided to put the table with the plates I was painting on a floor that I called the heritage floor. And I had, I was gonna put 999 names on the floor. Don't ask me, it was like biblical. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, which is funny, because I come from 23 generations of rabbis. Anyway, <laughs> so I had assembled about 300 names, and I, and then. <laughs> oh, now, now's my turn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'll step back just for a moment before the uh, then part, which was that in 1973 is when I first met Judy, which was at the opening of the Women's Building in Los Angeles. And I was a graduate student in art history at UCLA at the time, 
And I had enrolled in a course that was actually not part of the curriculum. It was an adjunct type course taught by uh, Ruth Iskin. And Ruth was a young uh, art historian and the class was on women artists. Now I had spent something like, I, I say, five years of my life up till that point sitting in darkened rooms, looking at slides of all the great men in, you know, in art. I had never seen one slide of a woman artist uh, during all of that time period. So I walk in in 1973 to the Women's Building and to Judy's show, the inaugural show, which was of her Great Lady series. And which was, prefigured the dinner party a series of abstract right. images of women on canvas. Mm -hmm. And it was the first time that I felt that I was really looking at art that spoke to me as a woman and, and also bringing you know, women's history figuratively. So through Ruth's class, uh, and, and the wind-up was that I actually bought a work out of that show. It was the first work of art I'd ever bought took me many months to pay for it. And during the course of that, I finally met Judy in person. Because my image of Judy at the opening of the women's building was that she was standing in the middle of the room. She was wearing a flower in her hair. She was standing next to Anais Nin. And I was way, way too scared to have ever walked up to you and said hello. But eventually met. And, and the ah uh, then was nearly about 20 months later. Again, I'm at the women's building because I was hanging out at the women's building. And Judy came up to me and said, what are you doing? And at that point, I was trying to learn German because we needed two languages for a doctoral degree. And I had passed my French exams, but I needed to learn. It was a requirement to learn German. And so my answer was, not much. <laughs> German was like flying over my head. And she invited me to her studio and said, um, I need research done on 3,000 women. How long will it take you to do it? <laughs> and me, being 27 years old, said six weeks. Who's doing this And I, here I am, still here, basically still doing research. Um, but one of the, you know, once I got serious about it, because through Ruth Iskin's class, I too was starting to buy books about women's history. And most of them written, many of those were written in the early 20th century and a lot written at the end of the 19th century, sort of on this wave, this feminist wave of, um, you know, the first wave of feminism. But um, I started off in a library. You have to remember, this is like 1975. There is no internet. There is no easy way to do research. No Google. There's no Google. You can't just like Google Mary Wollstonecraft and then get a whole, you know, Wikipedia. get, a, get a, no Wikipedia. There's nothing. So one of the first things that I found, and so you know, I went to the, you know, went to the card library. Women, women, women. You know, there's still not a whole lot. But I came across this six-volume work called the Female Biography. This is actually a set that I own now, uh, which took me years to find. Um, and it was written in 1803, six volumes on women's history, listed alphabetically, history of women. Mary Hayes in 1803 was influenced in a friend of Mary Wollstonecraft's. And she you know, spent years pulling together this history of women. And it was that kind of research that we first started to build this, you know, list of 3,000. Did, did you, didn't you tell me that it had never been checked yes, out? That, yeah, it, when I checked it out in, the, in 1975 or 1976, it had not been checked out in Jeez. over 60 years. Oh. And it was still in its perfect bindings, its perfect, you know, oh you know 1803 bindings. And, virtually untouched. And that led us, you know, so my singular sort of starting off doing the research. For Your the, the six <laughs> weeks. My six <laughs> weeks turned into a team uh, headed eventually by, as I started moving into doing more administrative work, headed by Anna Zold, who's at the top, 
uh, of this photo. Uh, Juliet Myers is somewhere. Right there, Juliet's right there. So <laughs> lovely Santa Fe uh, icon. Yes, yeah, so I don't even know her. <laughs> and um, yeah. And so, bless these. And so we started to have card files. <laughs> And of course, there is always a cat on the table. <laughs> always a cat, <laughs> part of Judy's. But I think what the inter the interesting thing was is, is that we really had to start to learn how to read history. Right. And that Which I had taught myself in my uh, self guided study tour. So uh, people would once the researchers started working with us, they would bring. We used index cards and hand wrote. They would bring index cards that, let's say they were researching Carolyn Herschel. The cards would be full of information about her brother, William. <laughs> and literally, we had to teach the researchers to go through books and on, on William Herschel, and there'd be a line. His sister, Caroline, was an astronomer, too. Another book. She found eight comets, another line. She was a musician, and, but she had to give up her career in order to help him with his astronomical studies. Right. Remember that? One mm -hmm. fact per card mm -hmm. until we were able to assemble a picture of the woman. Yeah. And That's why there's so many cards. <laughs> <laughs> and so many of us doing the research by then, because it was an impossible. And this is the library that we amassed. Yes. And this is at UNM Valencia. There's 2,000 books there. It's local. You should all go. Through the flower. Through the flower it. donated those books to UNM. And it's, uh, the books are used uh, all over the state because there's interlibrary inter loan. Mm -hmm. I remember when we initiated the library. And a young student at that there was a big section on women in art, and a young student came up to me and she said, "Women in art? <laughs> I'll never forget that." <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Next. So where did oh. the where did the research take us, and where did it lead? So it yeah, led to, you know, the names that are scrolled across yeah. this porcelain heritage floor. heritage floor, this porcelain <laughs> tile floor. Judy's up at the top, <laughs> looking down. I'm looking at the pattern on the floor. And th that was don't, the important part. Don't uh, <laughs> confuse this with some kind of hierarchical picture. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're working actually for you know a little piece of little piece of art history trivia. We are working in Century City as Century City was being built oh. in LA in a dis, you know in an unfinished building because it was we needed a huge space to be able to lay out the whole floor and to Apollo I want I want if you've seen this picture before right yes yeah. but the way we, because Apollo created the Judy Chicago font because we were asked so often for me to write out things and uh, it became, particularly when I did the Dior banners, it became impossible. So for this font, I hand wrote every letter like I did for the Judy Chicago font. And then it was, but that's put together by a computer. Gazillions of them were Xerox and put into, remember that, those kind of, we created a, uh, a big mm -hmm. box, and right. everyone has one letter. And by hand, the graphics team would tape together the letters right. to make the name. <clears throat> and then we would take those, we took those streams of names, because what had emerged from all this research was that there was a visual pattern to women's history, oh. which involved and that's why there are streams of names emanating from each place heading. So that, for example, under Queen Elizabeth's place setting, there's a stream of names of female rulers going back to Egyptian times. Similarly, uh, around Carolyn Herschel, there's a stream of names of women in science. 
around O'Keeffe. There's a stream of names of, of women artists. And that pattern is what you see on the heritage floor. So, yeah, um, no, nothing's random. <laughs> Moreover, uh, you know, one of the things I get asked all the time is, how do I fund my projects? And I was always, I finally got sort of frustrated because this is how I funded them, but now I, then I said, if you can't raise money, you can't make art, which is true. Speaking of which, so I wanted these tiles. It eventually so, took 2,300 hand-cast porcelain tiles that are uh, adhered to a series of wooden triangles that rest on a self-leveling floor system that was designed by the industrial designer who worked with us, Ken Gilliam. But I could still remember when I had to sign a contract for the porcelain tile. It was $11,000. This is in like the late 1970s. 78, 77, and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> because I had absolutely no idea how I was going to pay for the porcelain tiles. Mm -hmm. So it's about risk. Mm -hmm. Well, the whole, I think the whole, the whole making of the dinner party was about risk. Yeah. You know, none of us, we, we never knew from the beginning, you know, what it, what it would cost or how it would be funded. Because yeah, Ellen used to be asked all the time what it would cost. Well, she may know now, but I, I, I mean, if I had actually realized how much it was going to cost, you wouldn't have done it. I couldn't, I probably would have stopped. So I was like, okay, now I have to raise $11,000. <laughs> but it was good because it was done in chunks. It was, you know, in our head, it was done in chunks. And Judy would go out and lecture, take posters, I would start to lecture, take posters, you sold your art. We sat on the floor afterwards <laughs> on the stage and signed mm -hmm. posters. Right. Mm -hmm. And the original team of like three or four people became, wow. you know, 400. This was my 39th birthday. <laughs> wow. So right. Right. And Which I'll never forget because of course, we went all around the table and everybody introduced themselves. Uh, process that those of you who've been here before know we still do. And I'll never forget it. By then, my aunt, who was a very oppressed needleworker, my, my uncle was horrible. She had come to work on the needlework wall. Hi, Tressa. And um, she was reborn on the needlework wall because everybody just adored her. But then my mother retired. She had been a uh, medical secretary, so her sister was there, so she started coming. And at my birthday party, <laughs> my mother stands up and she says, Hello, I am the creator of the creator of all the things. <laughs> 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 oh. <laughs> like under the table. Oh. <laughs> Right. <laughs> you know how you felt in gra grammar school? <laughs> when your mother came. To <laughs> so most of the people who came to work came because they had either read Judy's autobiography, you know, my struggle as a woman artist, which had recently been published, or they came because they may have heard a lecture or something about Judy. But they came. They really came for the work to do the work. It was a work environment. Um, and everybody left their sort of personalities at home as uh -huh. best as possible. <laughs> <laughs> as best as possible. What's their um, personalities they were supposed to leave at home? <laughs> it was their problem. <laughs> True. So this is a picture of the needlework loft. Susan Hill, who's standing up with the red hair, now completely white. Um, was the head of needlework, but what was the interesting? Wait, 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 wait! You know how she became head of needlework. The first three people who came to work with me were Diane, and then a graduate student named Leonard Scurro, because I needed, I wanted the plates to rise up. He was a graduate student at UCLA in ceramics, and uh, the ceramicists there recommended him. And then a woman named Susan Hill wrote to me. She had read through the flower, and she asked if I ever took assistance. So I invited her to the studio, 
And at that time, we were really struggling to find researchers because no trained historian would, would work with us. It was kind of a ragtag group <laughs> of people who came together because they had a passion for the project and for women's history as we were discovering it. But Susan was like shit at research. So then I said, what are the skills do you have? She said, well, I can, I have needlework skills. My family all were needleworkers. Well, I'm not that great at it. At least I can do it. Well, at that time, I had this problem because the dinner party table was so long and uh, it was all white and there are these plates sitting on this white tablecloth. So I needed to do something on this tablecloth. So I figured I would embroider their names in a circle. This became like the great <laughs> studio joke, right? I bought, I bought myself an embroidery machine. And so I was learning how to embroider. Now I can't sew or stitch, but you know, I figured I could look for it. But then the joke on the needlework went off was, yeah, Judy thought she was going to turn 26. That was when the table was only 26 feet long. 26 foot long tablecloths around in a circle 13 times. <laughs> and they all look at each other. There's so many of them all sitting and they laugh at my, how foolish so, I was. So that led to the idea of having table runners. Yeah, but then I said to Susan, oh, because I was struggling with the embroidery machine. Okay, you know something about needlework, you're the head of needlework. <laughs> <laughs> and, she, and she accepted. Yeah, she did. And she yeah. was fantastic, mm -hmm. actually. So one of the... I mean, I always found, so the, the, um, the studio was oriented so that the bottom part of the studio had Judy's China Painting Studio and, and also had the ceramics. Yeah. And then upstairs there was a loft and the loft was where the needlework was done. And what was, what was interesting was that in the sort of tradition of quilting bees where women would come around and stitch, so the <coughs> multiple people would stitch together on, on these runners and stitch at the same time. But instead of having conversations really about you know home or home life, which would have been very typical at a quilting bee, the conversations usually turned to women's history and the and the history that they were working on, the historical underpinnings of the sh of the ex you know the show. But also, you know, Judy took you know historical needlework patterns from the time, so that when you look at these runners, they reflect a period of time that you know, the woman lived, so that they would, you know, so the needleworkers would also tell stories of women's <coughs> history. They would bring in information about needlework. They would bring in information about the women that they were working on. And that was a lot of the conversation at the time, so. And, and so I think that leads us into really the subject of today's talk, which was how learning women's history empowered the participants. Because, first of all, for those needleworkers who actually had needle skills, because a lot of, there were oftentimes where women trained women, but there were a lot of really skilled needle women. For them, they began to learn about the history that they were stitching. They learned about where the patterns came from, where the stitches came from the period of time they came from, who did the embroidery. But what I found the most interesting is the women would, the needleworkers would read the stories of the women whose runner they were working on to each other aloud. And now we're gonna talk about the stories that they learned and why those were empowering because the more they learned, the more passionate they became about working on a project that was going to teach hundreds of thousands of people what they were learning in the studio. Let's start with, okay, the... So when Judy and I were looking at the slides yesterday, we both looked at each other and said, why did we choose the snake goddess? <laughs> uh, Galen reminded me and then I remembered. The, in my research, one of the things I found was that all, now this has become established, but then it wasn't known at all. Then in fact, history was simply 
like uh, revised to fit patriarchal myths. So that I learned that it, all early societies worship goddesses. The first gods were not male. The first gods were female. And there is a fascinating trajectory in which then the myths tell the story of male and female deities ruling together. Then the male deity literally destroys the body of the female deity, like in the Tiamat myth, which was uh, Babylonian, I think, and creates the universe from her body. And then the male god triumphs. And then we're all raised with the idea that God is male. With all memory that God once was female, obliterated. And I think it's really important to understand that divinity residing in the male disadvantages women from the beginning. It makes us lesser. So that's one of the reasons the dinner party starts with the early matriarchal goddesses. Mm -hmm. And also, I always used to love the snake goddess when I was in art history, and then when I discovered, you know, and then I liked it, well, that's why I liked it. <laughs> and also, you know, visual, visual imagery really matters, so, yeah. you know, it was important to also to have, you know, the, the, these early goddess figures. And also, then I, I used the, not only did I use the needle techniques of the time, but I also use the, the uh, art historical motif. So like the front of the snake goddess runner mirrors the skirt mm -hmm. of the actual snake goddess figure. Aspasia. Aspasia. <laughs> and also, from the earliest days of patriarchy, women fought against it. Yeah. Aspasia was Pericles' companion at a time, Athens, the golden age of, a, of democracy, when women were sequestered and had no educational rights. <clears throat> Doesn't sound like the golden age to me. <laughs> anyway, Aspasia used to organize salons for women to teach them to read, for which she was almost killed. Mm -hmm. Her Pericles had to step in and save her. See, good guys. They were always good guys from the beginning. Yeah. You know, but it's also about, you know, why, do, why did I, you know, spend all of these years at university and never know, and study philosophy and never know who, any, who these women were? Well, we know what the answer is. <laughs> okay. Feminism, as we know it, actually started in the 15th century. It started with a book by Christine de Pizan, who was the first woman to support herself by writing. She supported her, she was a widow, and she supported her children mm -hmm. by writing. And she wrote a book called The Book of the City of Ladies, which was not in print when I was researching. And the only volume was in Old English, the last volume. So I could only read about it. But I read enough about it to know that the book deals with, she tells a story about sitting in her study, bemoaning the kind of misogynist literature that went on in the Renaissance. Mm -hmm. And three women appear to her. Yeah, she summons three women. Yeah, Truth, Justice, and what's the third one? Can't remember. Oh, God! <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you how long ago we did this. Uh, I mean, it's amazing. I still remember it, though. I actually, anyway, she said to them, is it true that women are inferior? And they said to her, now, Christine, don't be foolish. Of course women are not inferior, and they instructed her to create a literary city of women. Mm -hmm. 
which she did, she constructed the biographies of 500 women. And, of course, we had to construct that all over again, 500 years later, right? So, let's see what she said in those days. You read the yeah, book. if it were, well, I'll read. Yeah. If it were customary to send little girls to school and teach them the same subjects as they're taught to boys, they would learn just as fully and would understand the subtleties of all arts and sciences. Think about Afghanistan, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Actually, Christine's book kicked off the first feminist discourse that we know about. She started something, her book initiated something called Le Quarrel des Femmes, the quarrel of women that raged all over mm -hmm. Europe with everybody discussing whether or not the book were true, whether women were actually capable of equality, because of course there was the idea that women were not. And uh, that was Christine de Pizan. And if you go back for a second, you can see this is a, a, a manuscript illumination showing Christine de Pizan giving her book to her patron, mm -hmm. a one of the queens, and when Elizabeth Sackler acquired the dinner party and donated it to the Brooklyn Museum for permanent housing, I brought her that letter drawing and I got down on my knee and gave it to her. <laughs> the next step in modern feminism was laid by Mary Wollstonecraft in the 18th century in England, who, when her book, A Vindication of the Rights of the Woman, was published, she was accused of being a hyena in... Is that petticoats? It's no. better, yeah, something like petticoats. It wasn't clothes. It was no. hyena in some derogatory We'll, we'll read about fashion. it back there. Right, yeah, yeah, you can read it. On the <laughs> And we could have read, we could have run back and read the thing about <laughs> Yeah, we could have. We could have. <laughs> but we didn't. <laughs> okay, Gail, I'm going to get to read the next quote. I get to read the next quote. Yeah, her book was disregarded for 200 years. Yeah. But now it is recognized as the cornerstone of modern feminism. So she wrote, it is time to effect a revolution in female manners Time to restore them to their lost dignity and make them, as a part of the human species, labor by reforming themselves to reform the world. It is time to separate unchangeable morals from local manners. Well, that could have been written yesterday, didn't yeah. it? <laughs> That's what's so startling. That's why we're doing this talk, to suggest that what these women have to offer is unbelievably relevant today mm -hmm. when we see the gains of the last 50 years being pushed back all over the world. Mm -hmm. And we feel, particularly young people, feel helpless to do anything about it. Mm -hmm. But we have a rich history. Mm -hmm. We have a rich history, yes. and that's what we have to remember. And we have to draw on. <laughs> draw on it. And then there's this thing about intersectionality. It always irritates me that when young feminists are like, oh, well, you are so smart. We're intersectional. We're not like the 70s feminists who thought everybody was like, it was all about gender. Yeah, right. How about Sojourner Truth? The first person to ever e examine the intersection of race and gender. And what did she have to say? She had to say, if the first woman God ever made was strong enough to turn the world upside down all alone, these women together ought to be able to turn it back and get it right side up again. And now they is asking to do it, the men better let them. We should go read this to the Supreme Court. <laughs> <laughs> they won't listen. 
The queen of the table. Yeah. Really one of the, the you know, yeah. to me, that she was the queen, the queen of the table. And Susan I B. think the reason we feel like that is because Susan B. Anthony stood completely firm for 50 years. She never had anything. The shawl that is uh, underneath her plate refers to a silk shawl shawl that one of her admirers gave her when she was 80. It was the only thing she ever had that was uh, personally a personal adornment. Mm -hmm. She, uh, okay, so when I discovered the few books there were about Susan B. Anthony, I really got pissed off because by then we had found this book on the Woman's Building, which was part of the 1893 World's Fair in Chicago. It was a book intended to demonstrate, it was a, a building intended to demonstrate the worth of women's work. Mm -hmm. And it was built by a young female architect whose design was so attacked and criticized by male critics that she ended up in an insane asylum for the rest of her life. But still, at that time, it's really hard to understand the scope of the 19th century women's movement. It became international. The largest women's movement in the Western world was in Germany, which helps explain the patriarchal back Clash that we understand as Nazism. And we can see in that a similar pattern here in terms of this incredible patriarchal backlash against the gains of women, people of color, people of sexual or different sexual orientations, LBGT, transsexual, transgender, all the changes that we those of us who believe in freedom cherish. But I read this book about the woman's building in which they talked about when Susan B. Anthony appeared. She was one of the organizers. And people would stand up on their chairs and cheer her, men and women, because of her contributions to equality. And by the time I was in college, she was a footnote. And I'm like, really? What's that guy who, re who did that midnight ride? <laughs> Paul Revere, right? What did he do that allowed him to be famous in history compared to Susan B. Anthony completely changing the society that of the whole Western world? And of course, we know this is me, Anthony, and Elizabeth Cady so Stanton. You can see how it right. was with Katie Stanton. We're partners in crafting some of the next step in the establishment of feminist thought. So, a little uh, a footnote in history yeah. at the 1893, in the Women's Building at the 1893 Columbia Exposition, uh, Mary Cassatt right. did. A, I think it was 20 foot, 65 foot, 60, 65 foot. 65 foot mural of um, modern woman. Yeah, modern woman. There are photographs, it was lost. Completely lost. lost. Probably, possibly destroyed. Her greatest work of art. <coughs> Most depicted of women passing down the fruits of the, knowledge yeah. to their daughters. Oh. Yeah. Completely lost, much like our history. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And virtually, yeah, there's very few photographs of it. Okay, got yeah, Ellen, I guess. Do I get to read again? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because there will never be complete equality until women themselves help to make laws and elect lawmakers. Unless they use their vote to elect the wrong lawmakers, <laughs> which they seem to be doing for some inexplicable reason. So don't it's forget like to vote. voting against your own interests. Yeah. 
Okay. Margaret Sanger. Young people today cannot actually even imagine what the early birth control advocates faced. Margaret Sanger stood all by herself, a picture that Elizabeth tried to find, and I know exists because it's in the needlework book, but never mind. Anyway, she stood all by herself on a street corner with a placard. That's how the birth control movement started. She went to jail over and over and over again. She went to jail, she was released from jail, and she went back to her street corner. And she created a social revolution. I mean, she had this theory. She wrote a book called Unchained Motherhood, which was the inspiration for the letter drawing. She had this theory that women's capacity was hindered by not having control over her body. No woman can call herself free who does not own and control her own body, 1920. She's been smeared recently, actually. And it, it's a, it was a right-wing smear. There were a lot of, there were, in 2015, there were a number of Republican uh, congressmen, senators, who were trying to defund Planned Parenthood and they couldn't get anywhere. So they launched an attack on Margaret Sanger for her belief in eugenics, which was very popular in, 19, in the 1920s and 30s. It did, in fact, have very bad applications because of all the racism, sexism, idiocy of human beings. But it was an early attempt to do something we still can't do, which is population control. And um, anyway, she has been written out of history now, mm -hmm. even by Planned Parenthood, which mm -hmm. she founded. Wow. Because, and this is where, this is one of the reasons that when I was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame earlier this year, I did a talk about do women have to be perfect to be honored? Like, we had this maniac, racist, sexist, unqualified person who became the president. Men seem to be able to be really imperfect and still succeed. But women? No way. Out! <laughs> Away with you! <laughs> okay. Virginia Woolf. How many people have read A Woman's A Room of One's Own? Anybody in this room? Sure. The rest of you should get a copy. It's a really important book, I think, and really fundamental. Um, talking about what it takes to create and what it takes for a woman to create. Um, and to think. You know, to think, actually, mm -hmm. even have the space to think for herself. Mm -hmm. It takes a room of one's own. Yeah. Space to work, to give yourself the time. And she comes out of a rich tradition of women writers, and especially women writers in England. Um, Let's go to the next one because actually it comes back to what I was saying before about if you know if, if you want to make art you have to have money. I mean you have to raise money because intellectual freedom depends upon material things. Read the rest. Women have had less intellectual freedom than the sons of Athenian slaves. Women then have not had a dog's chance of writing poetry. That is why I've laid so much stress on money and a room of one's own. Okay, now I would like to ask the audience to help us read some of these quotes from our foremothers. Who wants to read Hildegard of Bingen from the 11th century? <laughs> 
Come on. I will. Good, good. Where is it? It's out of the top. <laughs> I, think you need, I think you need to lower your mask so people won't. Okay. Can you just lower your mask so people can hear you? Yes, thank you. We cannot live in a world that is not our own, in a world that is interrupted for us by others. An interpretive world is not home. Part of the terror is to take back our own listening, to use our own voice, to see our own light. She existed because of the support of the convent system in the Middle Ages. Who wants to read Marie de Gournay from the 16th century? I don't. Go ahead. If, if the ladies arrive less frequently to the heights of excellence than do the gentlemen, it is because of this lack of good education. It is sometimes due to the negative attitude of the teacher and nothing more. Mm -hmm. Women should not permit this to weaken their belief that they can achieve anything. Like imagine if I believed my history professor. <laughs> Okay, who wants to read? Yes, go. We have every reason to believe that our turn will come, not for women's supremacy, but for the as yet untried experiment of complete equality, when the united thought of man and woman will inaugurate a just government, a civilization at last in which ignorance, poverty, and crime will exist no more. Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Who votes for that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Anna Betancourt, who will read Anna Betancourt's words. I'll read it. Go. Okay. <clears throat> the citizens, a woman in the dark and quiet corner of the home, has waited patiently and resignedly for this beautiful occasion when a new revolution breaks its yoke and unties its wings. Her everything was a slave, origins, color, and sex. You want to destroy the slavery of origins by fighting to the death. You destroyed the slavery of color by emancipating the servants. The time has come to set women free. There's somebody to read that to the tail of them. Okay, Marin Anderson. Our own Marin Anderson. Yes. No, no matter how big a nation is, it is no stronger than its weakest people. And as long as you keep a person down, some part of him has to be down yeah. there to hold him down. So it means you cannot soar as you might otherwise. Who wants to read Frida Kahlo? <laughs> Sexism and racism are parallel problems. You can compare them in some ways, but they're not at all the same. But they're both symptoms inside the white male power structure. And who wants to read Simone de Beauvoir? Everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Go, Culture, science, the arts, and techniques were created by men, since it was men who stood for universality. Women must take over the tools forged by men and use them for their own interests. From our point of view, it seems to me that what is called for is a revision, not a repudiation of knowledge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, we're going to end with this last image from a series I did before I did the dinner party around the same time I was doing the great ladies and trying to figure out how to represent the women I was discovering. And this is an image, I, this is a series of drawings called Compressed Women Who Yearn to Be Butterflies. Mm -hmm. And it was all about women whose aspirations were cut short, cut off, limited. And this was a, a quote from, this is an image of Madame Deronda, who was the, one of the, was the character in George Eliot's Daniel Deronda. And in the book I found this quote that always, that really spoke to me, because it talks about how the constraints in society make you feel as a woman. You may try, but you can never imagine what it is to have a man's force of genius in you, and yet to suffer the slavery of being a girl. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, we're gonna <laughs> thank you. sign posters so you can take home a memento to remind yourself 
that there's still hope in this. <laughs>